and welcome to the American Pharmacist Association podcast series on vaccine co-administration and lifelong vaccine strategies for adults. This is the first of three podcasts, and we will be reviewing the best practice recommendations and guidelines for vaccine co-administration, as well as common concerns and questions that arise. My name is Tamara McCants, and I am an assistant professor at Howard University in the College of Pharmacy. My practice site is an independent pharmacy in Washington, D.C., and I have coordinated dozens of mass immunization efforts with Capital City Medical Reserve Corps. I am joined today by Lauren Angela, who is an associate professor in pharmacy practice at Rosalind Franklin University. She is the author of the Immunization Handbook for Pharmacists, which is in its fifth edition. She also participates in numerous advisory boards and educational initiatives specific to immunization activities. Let's start by defining the term co-administration for our listeners. Thank you, Tamara. And that's a great place to start. I think before we dive into this topic, let's just make sure we are all on the same page. Co-administration of vaccines refers to giving more than one vaccine to a patient during the same visit. It may also be referred to as concomitant or simultaneous administration. There are actually two groups who commonly get multiple vaccines in one visit, and we're accustomed to doing this. These are children and international travelers. The pediatric vaccine schedule includes multiple vaccines that are indicated for certain age groups. For instance, a four-year-old may need DTaP, polio, MMR, and varicella during one office visit. And then we tack on influenza and COVID-19, which may also be indicated depending on the time of year. Those traveling internationally often need several vaccines during a travel health visit to get adequate coverage prior to visiting high-risk areas. And now as we're seeing more vaccines being routinely recommended for our adult patients based on age or medical conditions, we are starting to see the need for co-administration during their visits to the pharmacy. Examples include influenza, COVID-19, herpes zoster, hepatitis B, pneumococcal, and Tdap. Now we have RSV and also meningococcal B and HPV. These could also be recommended based on shared clinical decision-making for our patients. So the focus of this podcast is the co-administration of vaccines in our adult patients, keeping these examples in mind. To all of our colleagues listening, there certainly could be a variety of opportunities to administer multiple vaccines safely to an adult patient during one visit to the pharmacy. It may also be helpful for our listeners if we review the CDC's guidelines and recommendations for co-administration of vaccines. Absolutely. By administering all of the vaccines a patient needs during the same visit, it avoids delays in providing protection against the diseases for which the patient is most at risk. We also don't need to worry about the patient returning to the pharmacy for additional vaccines, especially when we are not certain the patient will return. For the majority of vaccines our adult patients need, including both live and inactivated vaccines, co-administration has been shown to have similar seroconversion rates and adverse reactions when compared to administering the vaccine separately. A common point of confusion, however, is co-administration of live vaccines. Both live and inactivated vaccines can be administered during the same visit, even multiple live vaccines. If a patient needs more than one live vaccine and they were not administered during the same visit, then the patient will need to wait at least 28 days before getting the other live vaccine. This avoids potential interference with the body's immune response to the additional live vaccine administered. The risk for this interference is not well understood and there is limited data available. What has been used to support this recommendation dates back to the 1960s, But in any case, this is the guideline we need to follow and another advantage to administering two or more live vaccines simultaneously at the same visit. Great information, Lauren. So just to reiterate, it is okay to administer both live and inactivated vaccines during the same visit. Now let's shift gears and talk about adjuvanted vaccines for a moment. There are quite a few vaccines on the market that contains adjuvants, 
How does this factor in to the co-administration of vaccines? That's a great question, Tamara. I want to talk briefly about adjuvants, adjuvants and explain what they are. Then we'll talk about some of the recommendations that we've can, been given when we had co-administered them. So adjuvants are used to help boost the body's immune response to the vaccine. Some vaccines contain aluminum salts, which have been used for decades. And our newer adjuvanted vaccines contain novel non-aluminum adjuvants. Examples of these newer vaccines with non-aluminum adjuvants include the recombinant zoster vaccine, the adjuvanted influenza vaccine, the recombinant hepatitis B surface antigen vaccine, the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine, and Orexv, which is one of the new RSV vaccines. In theory, vaccines that contain adjuvants may be more reactogenic than vaccines without adjuvants. You mentioned the term reactogenic as you are referring to the vaccines. How would we explain this to patients? Absolutely. Good question. So reactogenicity is the body's physical inflammatory response following vaccination. These reactions may be local, such as pain, swelling, or redness at the injection site. Or they might be systemic, such as fever, myalgia, and headaches. So when we're counseling patients regarding these adverse effects and what to expect, it helps to explain why they occur. Basically, it's our body's way of letting us know it is responding to the vaccine and our body is now working to build immunity. It is possible to expect slightly more local and systemic reactions when two vaccines that are known to be reactogenic are administered at the same time. So in terms of the newer non-aluminum adjuvanted vaccines, we just don't have a lot of data on co-administration in terms of immunogenicity and adverse reactions. So the CDC has advised us that when vaccines with non-aluminum adjuvants are co-administered with other vaccines, that they may be given in separate anatomic sites. But really, this is advice for all co-administered vaccines when we're able to do so. Thank you so much for that refresher, Lauren. I'm sure the listeners appreciate it just as much as I did. So when it comes to reactogenicity and adverse reactions from vaccines, co-administration may actually be advantageous. I think patients would agree that getting one or two sore arms and maybe a headache or flu-like symptoms just one time, as opposed to multiple times, would be better, especially if the vaccines are spread out. <laughs> That's a good point, Tamara. And while we're on the topic of adjuvanted vaccines, there is actually one flu vaccine that I mentioned that is adjuvanted. And we do have some guidance for this uh, in the seasonal influenza recommendations that come out in the MMWR every year. So if a patient needs both a flu shot and a non-aluminum adjuvanted vaccine, such as the recombinant zoster vaccine, for example, then it would be preferred to select one of the influenza vaccines that does not contain an adjuvant. However, if such an alternative influenza vaccine is not available, then the recommendation is to proceed with co-administration of both adjuvanted vaccines. So how about we move on to discuss two of our newer vaccines and the guidance we have for co-administration of those. The first one I want to talk about is the RSV vaccine. So we had two that came to market um, earlier this fall. And so with the new RSV vaccines, the current CDC guidance is that co-administration of an RSV vaccine with other vaccines is acceptable and should be based on a provider's assessment of the patient and circumstances. Considerations include other vaccines needed, whether or not the patient will return for follow-up visits, the risk for disease if they are not vaccinated, reactogenicity of the vaccines, and patient preferences. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I've had more people seeking the COVID-19 vaccine this fall. Even though we are out of the pandemic, COVID is still here. So I'd like to take a moment to address co-administration as it relates to COVID-19. So currently, the guidance for co-administration of COVID-19 vaccines with other vaccines follows the ACIP's best practice guidelines for immunizations. This states that routine administration of all age-appropriate doses at the same time is recommended so long as there are no contraindications. In fact, the CDC specifically states that providers may simultaneously administer COVID-19 influenza, and RSV vaccines to eligible patients, and it is perfectly safe. 
Thank you, Tamara, for that information. And I know we'll be seeing patients if we haven't already requesting all three of those vaccines. As a reminder, when we're administering multiple vaccines during the same visit, separate the injection sites by at least one inch if they are going to be administered in the same limb. You can also consider administering the vaccines in separate limbs if there is an increased likelihood of a local reaction from the vaccines, and that's what we were talking about in terms of reactogenicity. So for IM injections, the deltoid muscle and the anterolateral thigh are all options in our adult patients. Using separate limbs also allows us to easily identify which vaccine may have caused a reaction if a local reaction were to occur. But I do want to remind everyone, as always, be sure to report any unexpected or serious vaccine reactions to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. So now that we have reminded our listeners that it is perfectly safe to co-administer several vaccines at a time, let's talk about how we address vaccine hesitancy. Even though vaccines have played a crucial role in safeguarding public health for decades, vaccine hesitancy still seems to be a significant challenge. The World Health Organization Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, or SAGE, defined vaccine hesitancy as a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite availability of vaccination services. And I wanted to really emphasize the word delay. It doesn't mean that the patient does not want to do it. They just have hesitation, which means that as the pharmacist, with consistent messaging and addressing people's anxiety around vaccines, we can empower our patients to make informed decisions about their health. Why people may not want a vaccine can be very complex and should not be oversimplified. Social and political influences, cultural and religious beliefs, how people access and interpret health and scientific information, and personal and population experiences with the healthcare system can determine how many times a person has to be educated about a vaccine before they move forward with getting immunized. And I think we're seeing a variety of vaccine hesitancy in our pharmacies. Um, So I think that's a good reminder. And and as we move forward with this podcast, we'll talk about some recommendations for how to address that. And one of the things I want to reflect on is you mentioned the SAGE work group tomorrow. So they utilize something called the three C's. And this can actually help address vaccine hesitancy. Can you explain what these, these three C's are for our listeners? The three C's. I know acronyms like this is what got me through pharmacy school, so I love it. So the first C stands for confidence. We need to instill confidence in our patients by providing safety and efficacy information and address any mistrust and any misinformation. The second C stands for complacency. Educate our patients about their risk for contracting the disease and for getting sick, hospitalization, and death. This is a very individualized conversation. And I do want to note that the doom and gloom typically does not work. So if you're going to say something like, well, everybody's going to die or everybody's going to get sick if they don't get the vaccine, that's not going to really be as effective. But we do want individuals to know their own individual risk. And finally, the third C is for convenience. The primary reason why the local community pharmacy is a great place to offer the vaccine is because people can get there. The hours are convenient and the pharmacy has accessible information. So now this is a perfect segue to our next topic, optimizing the workflow. How do we provide convenience for our patients and not compromise our work conditions? That's a great direction we should head in, Tamara. And I do want to call out that the increasing demand for vaccines that we've seen during the pandemic, it's been more important than ever for pharmacies to have a streamlined process within their pharmacies and their workflow. And the COVID-19 pandemic has given pharmacists as well as our technicians a lot more responsibility in terms of vaccine administration and pandemic countermeasures. With that comes increased workload, and it can be difficult to create a good balance. Tamara, what advice do you have for managing these additional tasks and vaccine needs of our patients? 
Yes, because it can be managed with just a little planning. So the first, efficient appointment scheduling is key. During the respiratory season, patients come to the pharmacy for various vaccines like influenza. This is a great opportunity to offer additional vaccines that they may be eligible for, such as Tdap and shingles. While the convenience of walk-in appointments may be valued by patients, we should set expectations for them if they do decide to walk in that it could be a long wait time. So be sure to also review scheduling times regularly to make sure that they are realistic for your store and in your current environment. The next step is to optimize your technology for workflow and systems management. This means possibly going back and being retrained on your computer system to make sure all features of your software is being maximized while you are doing the dispensing function. Communication is also another vital aspect. Establish clear communication channels within the pharmacy team to make sure that everyone is on the same page. This is especially crucial during peak immunization seasons where it can really get stressful. But a well-coordinated team ensures that patients receive timely and accurate information, contributing to a seamless workflow. Most importantly, though, utilize pharmacy students, pharmacy technicians, and pharmacy assistants as much as possible. They can be in charge of tasks including order entry, billing, inventory management, information gathering, the consent process, post-injection monitoring, reporting, and actual administration of the vaccine if they meet the requirements. When you incorporate these strategies, they can enhance your work environment, make you feel less stressed to meet the very important vaccination needs of your patients. Ensuring that patients are well informed about vaccinations is the most important piece in all of this. This involves providing clear, accessible information about the importance of vaccines, the diseases they prevent, and the potential risk and benefits. Educating patients empowers them to make informed decisions about their health. It is going to be necessary to engage in several open and respectful conversations to build trust and address misconceptions. Thank you so much, Tamara. It's been a pleasure doing this podcast with you. I think we've covered some great points regarding co-administration of vaccines. And that's really all for today's program. So thanks for joining us in this brief exploration of discussing co-administration of vaccines. Remember, pharmacists are instrumental in protecting our community against vaccine-preventable disease. We hope that we gave you some tools today to make it easier for you and your staff. Be sure to tune in for our next two podcasts. The next one will cover vaccines across the lifespan. Until next time.